Hey, it's Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Welcome to the Going Scared Podcast. Today's episode on the Going Scared Podcast is Bob Goff, and our conversation covers so much. If you don't know Bob yet, I know you're going to fall in love with him today. Bob Goff is a self-proclaimed recovering lawyer. After 25 years of practicing law, he gave up his practice and became the honorary consul to Uganda. He literally has the Ugandan flag in his front yard. He began to write, to speak. He makes a difference all over the world. He leads small conferences, and he really is about helping people accomplish their dreams. And if you've ever met Bob or you've heard him speak, you know that he has an infectious laughter and honestly, one of the most supremely optimistic outlooks on life of anyone I've ever known. His New York Times bestselling book, Love Does, includes stories from his own life about what happens when we actually give ourselves the freedom to choose love and faith over fear and doubt. He also has a nonprofit, which we'll talk about some today, called Love Does, and has several different projects in countries like Uganda, Nepal, India, Iraq, and Somalia. And the world is about to get a lot more beautiful because he has another book that's out now for purchase. It's a much anticipated follow-up to Love Does, and it's entitled Everybody Always. I can't wait to hear what you learned from this episode. Bob really is a modern day love teacher for our time. And I I know I learned a ton from today's conversation. I can't wait to hear what you learn as well. Hey, Bob, welcome to today's episode of Going Scared. Hey, thanks a million for having me. It's great being with you. So I was sitting with my family on Sunday night and we were all kind of going around riffing about our upcoming week. And I named a couple of the folks I was interviewing for the podcast and I mentioned your name and my eight-year-old says, well, who's that? And my husband says, it's a man famous for being joyful. Oh, that's awesome. That would be a great (laughs) reputation to have rather than the like person famous for like stealing a little children's bicycle (laughs) or something. (laughs) Yeah. But it did give me pause because I thought, what a reputation to have. And I know that you you sort of know that, that people sort of experience you as a joyful guy. I know the few times I've been around you, that's certainly true. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about what has your journey been to joy? Or did you just kind of come out of the womb like this? Yeah, like Zoroaster's child. Yeah, the uh, I was always a pretty upbeat guy, but I think I think a... a important turning point for me uh, is what would be common maybe to your listeners. At some point, I realized I'm not my parents. And I thought I was supposed to be and they were terrific. And everybody else's parents are probably terrific too. But realizing that God makes each of us just wonderfully so different and then living into that. And so we end up playing these roles. Like I'm a trial lawyer. I try like hundred million dollar cases, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, and you think you're supposed to be like uptight or wear a tweed jacket and elbow patches and stroke your beard. But like instead, just be whoever God made you to be. We don't have to play a role. And just uh, similarly, you don't have to play a role of being joyful. If I've had some tough days and and you have two, all of your listeners, but just be authentically kind of who you are. Uh, but as sweet Maria Goff keeps reminding me, just kind of say, what are my better angels? What's a better, more humble next version of Bob and try to live into that guy. So when you, you really feel like joy is all about living into your authenticity. I think it's that. And it's also, it's looking and being engaged because you'll kind of see what you're looking for. I hadn't uh, thought about a 1971 Volkswagen bus for 20 years. And then I decided I wanted a 1971 bus. (laughs) Every third car is a 1971 bus because you'll find what you're looking for. And so uh, some people uh, have had some difficulties and or perhaps have over identified with them a little bit and they've become cynics. And I've never met a courageous cynic. 
I, I just, I, I think we'll find what you're looking for. And if you're looking for unhappy news, you'll find it. And if you're looking for joy, you're going to find that too. If you're looking for hope, you'll find it. And I'm not saying just like being you know, like kind of yippy skippy and putting this veneer of happy on, on everything, but just be so engaged. It'll get you out of whatever it is that you're doing. And then find these beautiful cadences in your life. I'm the only trial lawyer I know who wears a Mickey Mouse watch. <laughs> and when things go a little bit wrong, I'm like, when if he's smiling, I'm smiling. <laughs> I just he's surrounding yourself with reminders about who you want to be. I love that. You'll find what you're looking for. So look for joy. That's That's a good one. Some time where you felt like you were uh, prevented from something, give it a little bit. You'll probably retitle that chapter protected. It's it's so true. Yeah. So I just think that's it. So um, don't be too quick to title your chapter that you're in with the difficulties. The first word that comes to mind, give it a little while and get a better name. Yeah. There's so much power in reframing. So I wanted to ask you, because you are working in difficult. I mean, you've chosen to go into difficult places. You've chosen to go um, work among people who suffer. And I know we have a huge love, both of us, for the country of Uganda. Oh, yeah. What a great place. I know you love that place. So that's where Noonday started. And then I know that you are currently the honorary consul to Uganda. You told me once that you have the Ugandan flag in your yard, waving in your front yard. I actually do. It's at the top of the flagpole. And the crazy part is that that makes me a diplomatic mission for a foreign government. Like literally, my house is not America. It's Uganda. <laughs> Come over. That is crazy. <laughs> Truly. Okay, so I want you to share with us today, what is the origin story for the creation of your nonprofit, Love Does? Because I know you were inspired in India, but then you became the honorary consul to Uganda. And so what? tell us what led to all the work that you're doing now in Uganda and then in all of the other countries where you guys have a presence. Yeah, I'll back it up a little bit. It it was uh, born out of the same thing that many of the folks that are listening uh, have, which is this big, beautiful idea that you could actually be helpful to people. So I went to all these organizations and I said, so can I help out? And every single one of them said no. (laughs) There was this one outfit. I love these guys. They're like worldwide. They're making such a big difference. And and I'm actually friends with all their uh, people over there said, I don't need a day job. You don't have to pay me. I'll just uh, come and work for you for nothing. And they said, no, <laughs> it was like they couldn't afford me. They just didn't want me. And so one of the things that we all have to decide is how are we going to name that chapter? Are you going to say that like God closed the door? Or are you going to just say, no, 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 I really have this beautiful idea. I want to fail trying. I'm not going to fail watching anymore. I'm going to fail trying. And so I just started Love Does only because like nobody would have me. (laughs) I would have been happy to work for somebody else. Shoot, I'll go to work for you. Um, But the whole idea of uh, not uh, mislabeling these closed doors, you have a beautiful ambition you've had for 20 years and you ask Billy if you can have a job and he says no. And and you say when people tell me they God closed the door, I'm like, no, Billy said no. That's the only thing that happened right there. (laughs) So so overcome some of those impediments. And then Thomas Nelson asked me if I'd write a book, which was so nice of them to do. And so I traded him one book for one school. And uh, they were like, how big's the school? And now it's got a thousand kids in it. Wow. And they're like, big school. I said, big book. <laughs> and I made them pay me in advance because I didn't know if it'd be any good. And so one of the things that you do is you just start. And then, um, and then one thing will lead to another. They sold a couple more copies of it. And we started schools in different countries. So usually just kind of... Uh, uh, countries that are in conflict. So we've got one in Iraq and uh, Somalia. And uh, our next one, we're starting uh, our next school in Afghanistan in May. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Wow. So that the whole idea to fail trying, just see a need, meet a need. And here's the deal. God isn't dazzled when we go across an ocean. He delights when we walk across the street. 
And sometimes we think it's more noble to do just something far away. And indeed, it's just a beautiful thing. I think we're all tied for first in God's mind. But to just go across the street, go across the office, go across, you know, wherever it is that you're working and find somebody in need and ask them if they're hungry and give them a burger. (laughs) <laughs> mm. just super simple and that's where it is can actually be replicated super easy that's so true well y'all's impact report for this last year was stunning i sent it to my creative team because we're going to do our first ever impact report and i was like just follow whatever they did because it's just so beautiful Oh, we just got a, uh, there was a, a people group in the Western desert in Somalia and El Shabaab, which is Al Qaeda's arm in Somalia, drew a 14 mile circle around where they were and they decided to starve them to death. They cut off all the roads, all the access. And, and so we uh, chartered a cargo plane and we flew right over their heads and landed on the sand. <laughs> Wow. I'm like in your face. But again, just find a need, meet a need, find something locally, find something internationally, whatever it is, wherever there's an opportunity, go do that and then write into that chapter. Okay, so there are a lot of opportunities because there is a lot of need around the world. So I'm curious, what are some of those injustices or issues that are weighing on you right now? Well, it's little girls that aren't able to uh, learn how to read or write because mm-hmm. they're girls. And I'm like, oh, heck no. So uh, the we've got a school in Somalia. We've got safe houses there. In Iraq, when uh, ISIS took 7,000 Yazidi women, they left so many of these young girls behind. And so we've got a school for them. And uh, in Uganda, we, uh, we're trying to like shift it a little bit more. So I think we're about 70% uh, girls at this, uh, school of ours. Cause I want to make women presidents. Yes. I want they, you know what? Yeah. Uganda did. They fired every male ambassador on earth and replaced them with women because <laughs> guys tend to talk about it. Women get it done. I mean, you proved that a hundred times and Uganda's hip to that. They're like, I'm going to just going to go get a bunch of go for it women and we'll go run the entire country. Yeah, Uganda's on fire with female entrepreneurs. It's super inspiring to me. Isn't that beautiful? And then that whole idea, not my phrase, but to give a a girl a book. What we do is when these girls uh, graduate from school, if they want to go to university, we pay for it. It They get a free ride uh, to college. Uh, What we're asking is, could you just hold off on maybe starting that family, the things that might take you off track from achieving some of the things that you might want to achieve uh, to later. If you want to have a family, that's terrific. But I'm telling you, I'll send you to school for free. (laughs) I'll let you get your degree. And then let's get you into parliament, girl. Parliament. I love that. Okay. I feel a little strange asking this because I feel like you're just like, I don't even know that term, but there is this term compassion fatigue. And I feel like those of us that are working in social justice, we have, we really understand, right, these places of suffering in the world. And we're really encouraging other people to get involved. And so compassion fatigue can be sort of indifference that people can start to feel because of the appeal to go help and go do. Is that something that you've seen either in your life or in those that come alongside your organization? Like, how do you stay tender to continually having a compassionate heart to all of the suffering that you come up against? What a great question. And you know what? The first thing that I uh, uh, thought is that every single person listening is kind of an expert on themselves. So they could actually answer your question. It would be so great to have like kind of a moment of silence and everybody just get real with how do you deal with just over identifying with people's difficulties. Mm. And then uh, and one of the things that uh, I can just say is an observation for me is finding a cadence in my life. Uh, knowing who I'm going to be 10 years from now. So I'm 59. So uh, what I end up doing is spending a lot of time talking to 69-year-old Bob. So if you're 30, add 10. So think of the 40-year-old woman or the 40-year-old man. So if you can think of who you're going to be 10 years from now, uh, let that person inform what you're doing right now. So I'll give you an example. 10 years from now, I hope I have a bunch of grand killed 
grandkids that are nine years old. <laughs> grandkids. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing all of my away games now because I'm playing only home games. We schedule things nine months and one day in the future. Uh, because I won sonogram, I'm out. You are hilarious. No wonder. Oh I met Lindsay a couple of weeks ago, Lindsay and Maria at an event with Darling and Magnolia. And I'm like, how are your kids doing? And she's like, oh gosh, oh God. Well, no yeah. wonder. <laughs> That's all I talk about. Yeah, but so one of the things uh, that if you know who it is that you want to be, think of the woman that you want to become and then let that woman inform who you are right now, what you do. Because I'm not gonna be with anybody later, you will never hear from me again. Uh, because I know who I'm gonna become, now I wanna be with everybody. Because like this is kind of the farewell lap while I'm waiting for a sonogram. I just wanna say whatever it is that I have to say. So what I do is uh, literally, there's not a square between now and nine months and a day from now that isn't filled with something. Uh, like this, uh, or being on the road talking to people. However, I get home for supper. So I've been to the East Coast, I think four times this week. So I'll go to South Carolina, I'll speak, and then I'll fly home for supper. And then next morning, I'll fly to Orlando, I'll say something, I fly home for supper. They call me Mr. G at the airport. Like literally, I have the TSA guy over for Christmas. <laughs> it's great. But if you just like this idea of continuing to run home to the people that you love the mm. most. A lot of us get so caught up in our ambitions and to want to serve people who are hurting and all that, that we're actually not present anymore. We're actually just in proximity to the people that we love, but we're never actually present with them. And I would say that's a great time to sit down with a 10 year old version of you and have the, have the whole talk, do the DTR. Mm. <laughs> Let's define this relationship with who I'm becoming. And if you figure out that now you're set. And here's the last thing. Don't forget the eight-year-old version of you. Like that winsome, wonderful, exciting, we're worried about how to make rent or pay taxes. So I would say take that eight-year-old version and hold them in one hand. Take the 10-year-old version of you in the other hand and then have you and all three of you make one really well-adjusted person. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. I love that idea that like presence to the people that love you most and that you love most is actually what can fuel you to love those that are far away from you. Yeah, bingo. Because if you're like in the proc, just in proximity, but you're on the phone and doing this, you know what sweet Marie and I do? We have this uh, softball and we just play catch with it while we're talking. Isn't that awesome? You answer your phone, you'll lose teeth. And one last idea is this. Uh, instead of saying, how's your life working for you? You might ask, how's your life working for the people around you that you love the most? So sometimes on this idea of compassion fatigue, it's not you that's getting worn out because you're like the energizer bunny. Um, but the people that are around you, that are loving you, that miss you, like, how's your life working for them? And it's just such a beautiful palms up kind of question to ask the people you love to say, how's my life working for you? And you know what Maria's told me a couple of times? Not well. <laughs> and that's like, oh, so hard to hear, but so good to make these little mid-course adjustments, right? That's how the astronauts get the moon. They get the moon in the window and they make a thousand mid-course corrections to get there. So good. We, we just built a hot tub in our backyard kind of for that reason, because you can't take your phone into water, you know? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Everybody will get electrocuted. Either way, you'll have an awesome story. <laughs> right. I like get a hot tub. Can't bring my phone there. We So I do like hot tub nights with the kids. And it's it's hilarious. My little eight and nine year olds, we pour each other fake champagne into champagne glasses and get back in the hot tub. But it's true. It's, it is hard. I think for those of us that are sort of um, wired to bring the energy to stop and be present and ask how is this working for you? How's my life working for you? That's, that's a uh, really convicting. I did a pretty, I, I did a big swallow when you, when you said that. One of the things too, is finding a cadence. Like as you know, we spend nine months a year in San Diego and running around, but three months a year, we just, uh, unplug. We have a place that's far away and remote and 
we just go up there and just catch our breath and grow radishes and stuff. <laughs> really important things. And so one of the things, speaking of radishes, is that we just need to not be each other's parole officer. So uh, the people that you love the most, we're not trying to bust their chops as we're uh, as we're all moving forward in this, because if you want to grow a radish, I figured out you can grow it in about 20 days. But if you want to grow a pear, it takes seven years. And so we're just realizing that God is up to different things and different people at different paces. And so some of the people that are around you might be up to something. You don't compare yourself with what other people are doing. Maria said it so beautifully, keep your eyes on your own paper. Uh, that idea that God doesn't compare what he creates. He just creates. So we'll co create and not look at other people, what they're creating and compare yourself because comparison's a punk. It will steal your lunch money every single time. Every time. Yep. Okay. So you, you mentioned uh, Thomas Nelson said, write a book and you're like, hmm, okay, well, that, that book pretty much exploded. How many languages is it in now? 17. Isn't that true? That is insane. That is insane. <laughs> oh my gosh. Which just shows you how, what a broad reach it has. And I think so much of that is because our brains are wired for story and you're a storyteller. I mean, you are such an incredible storyteller. You help us make connections that a lot of us can't don't naturally make. And so you have a new coming out, everybody always. Yeah, that's it. I'm five years late. I was literally getting registered mail from the publisher. They're like, where's the book? I'm like, buddy, I got nothing to say. I kind of said it all. And then it seemed like everybody was so on edge with uh, just uh, now more than ever. And this whole idea that uh, it's easy to love people like you, you're low hanging fruit. I mean, because you're just nice. Um, but how do we love the people who creep us out and, uh, yeah. we're just surrounded. And here's the crazy part. The people that creep us out, we creep them out. <laughs> and so the idea of being a little bit more kind and generous with people, I'm not trying to figure out how to love people who are easy to love. I want my kind of a report card on my faith is how I'm loving the people that are actually very difficult to love. And, um, uh, and so that's what I'm, I've been working on. And so I was just kind of thinking out loud and, uh, spelled enough words in the right order. And, uh, and so we put some, uh, fingerprints on the cover of this thing and you want to know something crazy, the cover of this book, what? it looks like it's balloons. It's not, we have a witch doctor school in Uganda. We don't teach them how to be witch doctors. They already know we, we teach them how to read and write. Because the old version of them used to sacrifice children. And instead of calling them names or calling them wrong, we just decided to be their friends while I was trying death penalty cases against witch doctors. I'm like, you do not want to touch another kid because you will never be seen again. But instead of trying to be right, I'm actually trying to be kind. And so mm. we started this witch doctor school. And, uh, and so I asked them, could you we get your fingerprints and make the cover out of your fingerprints? <laughs> Whoa, I love that. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? They're like, what does this mean? I'm like, don't worry about it. But there's something beautiful about taking the people that we've, I've spent my whole life avoiding the people Jesus spent his whole life engaging. And because mm. I didn't want to get any on me. And I think this idea of everybody always is to get it on you. You want to look kind, go find difficult people and be kind to them. Uh, they say people look like their dogs. I don't know if that's true or not, but people who are trying to be kind actually look kind. <laughs> it's like mm. they have it tattooed on their face. They're just people who are finding joy in other people. Uh, even the difficult people, they actually seem a little bit more joyful. And so we all have our off days, but I'm just trying to talk to that 10 year old version of me and say, he has told me, go find difficult people and love them the way people have loved you when you were really difficult. <laughs> so good. I, it does feel like you in particular have something to speak into the atmosphere of today, which I think we're all finding a lot of us being difficult. I mean, some people might find me difficult, whereas another person might find, you know, someone else difficult. And so 
What are some of the love strategies that you are going to help us break down that are going to help us love the people who do feel difficult for us to love? Oh, well, here's a a great one is figure out what love is. I tried Mm -hmm. talking Lindsay into being a nun when she was in high school, but she wasn't buying it. Um, But one of the things that I mentioned is when uh, you uh, like uh, guys ask you out on to the prom, ask them, what's your definition of love? Uh, and, and because they're guys, they won't know. <laughs> so, well, you go home, figure out what love is. And as soon as you know what it is, let me know. And I'll tell you if I'll go with you. And if they come back and say, it's like butterflies, you could get that from bad pizza, but love is sacrifice and commitment. Mm. So if we just, just to get clear on what love is, then it'll bring when we, instead of letting Hallmark say like, I love you, I love you, I love you say like, is that sacrifice? Am I so committed to loving somebody that'll get past having an agenda for him? Cause when love has an agenda, it ain't love. Um, so what I want to do is get past the agendas, keep it super real. It's sacrifice and commitment. And one of the things that you might have to sacrifice is your big opinion about something. Mm. Just be kind. Just assume that, you know, God's growing a pear (laughs) instead of a radish there, and it's going to take a while. Uh, And it's hard for me for it to take a while because I'm an ADD boy. I mean, like I make coffee nervous. I'm just so (laughs) amped as you've experienced. And so (laughs) what I'm trying to do is slow it down a little bit, just chill out and just assume that God might be something up to something different in their life than he happens to be up to in my life right now. And so I don't need to be the arbiter uh, of things. I don't need to be calling balls and strikes on their life. What I want to be is just engaged and kind. And when they say something lame, I, I've gotten to more than the end of one day and, and found that my untucked shirt was one button off. <laughs> Does that ever happen to you? I'm like, no. And so I think the people that have shaped my faith, my understanding what love is the most, were a button or two off in theirs. Um, and so my teachers have actually been the people that blew it more than the people that felt like they nailed it. Mm. I actually teach a class up at Pepperdine Law School of all places. Can you imagine me teaching a law school class? I teach a class on failure. And all I do every week is bring my friends who've screwed up in. (laughs) I'm going to call you, Jessica. You just have to come with your biggest screw up. (laughs) For me, it's a target rich environment. I mean, like everything. (laughs) But it's so it's so good, especially for young people, because I think young people see successful people and just assume that it was all rainbows and unicorns getting there. So I love that you're doing that. And I love that you just said that we just need to start with our definition of love because some of us might be starting with the wrong definition. Oh, yeah, because we were we uh, had this limiting belief that we didn't even realize was there. You had a mom and a dad who split or something happened and, and you didn't realize that uh, uh, that you've got this belief system going in that eventually if I give away my love, they'll leave me. And so getting clear on some of those things, like what is it uh, that are these underlying beliefs that you have? You know, one for me, which is kind of crazy, I just uh, somehow in high school, I got in my mind that if people really got to know me, that they wouldn't like me. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So we get each of us have these uh, beliefs and just like, just check the return address on Mm. that to say, where did that one come from? And I don't want to over identify with uh, these mess ups that help participate in this like limiting belief, but I want to get real about it and say, oh, wow. So that's one of those things that keeps coming up. And this idea that uh, that we uh, are uh, defined somehow by our biggest failures, people that have gotten into some relationships that were wrong or something went just really weird. And, and you want to keep this big secret and and just realizing that God calls us beloved, mm. like over our biggest mess up. Uh, and, and for anybody even listening, if you're hearing some other word beside the word beloved spoken over you, uh, man, that is not love talking. Mm. Uh, that's just one of these 
beliefs. It was one of these things. And so talk to that 10 year old version of you. They'll straighten you out. Talk to that eight year old. They'll get you squared on it. Mm, That's so good. So good. So you talk about limiting beliefs and this podcast is all about going scared and just getting up and walking through your fears. And I think so much of our ability to be able to stand up and walk is to be able to recognize some of those limiting beliefs. And I'm curious, I've heard this, that after you've had some wild success, like say a book like Love Does, and now you're about to launch a new book, are there any new fears that are coming up? Do you feel like you're going scared at all? Or it, it's not really, that's not really a thing for you? Oh, yeah. Everybody's uh, second book always stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You know, I can think of some of my author friends and they killed it with the first book and the second book is like, eh, whatever. You can get like a thousand of them for a nickel at Costco now. Uh, but but one of the things, I wrote this whole book, uh, this one, and then I was visiting a friend up in San Francisco who left his big church to just uh, be with some people in some really difficult circumstances. And while I was up there, somebody broke into the car and they took my laptop. And it had the book. It wasn't backed up. <laughs> oh my gosh. You are kidding me. 5,000 words just evaporated and half of them at least were spelled correctly. And so I had to start all over again. So this is actually my third book. I've just skipped over the sophomore slump. <laughs> oh my gosh. That just gave me PTSD for you. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It wasn't about you like uh, iCloud. It's like a nickel a year. But I was thought, you know what? I just uh, I just started again. And here's the beautiful thing. I wrote a different book because what we need to be is this this next version of Bob wrote the next book, and uh, and it just very bears very little uh, like. Uh, similarity at all to the first book as much as I can remember about it. Um, It's about just who we turn it into and how can we be kinder people? And it's not just squishy. I was going to write a murder mystery, but I thought I'd stay in my lane. <laughs> okay. So when I met you a couple years ago, we were speaking at a, at a kind of a business audience to a business audience together. And you had just lost your home up in Canada to a fire. Now you're telling me that your book was stolen out of someone's car, but there is a serious resilience to you. So talk a little bit about your, uh, your resilience. Like how, what are some resilient strategies that help you recover from some of these really difficult things? Yeah, maybe it's that idea. After the lodge burned down, I would have named that chapter, I'm out. It took Mm. me a few years to build that thing and it burned down. And so I gave it a little while. And you know what the new chapter title would be? I'm back. I'm back. (laughs) So we just poured the foundations yesterday. Like literally. So we're just. You did? Wow. Yeah, I'm making a bigger one. Um, So like the whole idea is this, like that that we all take a hit and I'm not just, I'm not like Tigger and like, whatever. Um, sometimes it can come across like that veneer of like indifference, but actually I'm like deeply uh, wounded and I'm deeply saddened, but I'm not stuck. And I think that's what happens sometimes that you get stuck in this eddy of introspection and reflection and why me and it ain't fair and all that. And so to just, I think that, I would just like a tow truck, get the 10 year old version of you to hook up a cable and get you out of the mud. <laughs> just say, I don't have a title for that thing yet, but I need Mater in my life <laughs> to come and get me out of the pickle weed uh, and to just say, okay, there's going to be a title. I'm gonna, this is going to take a minute or two, uh, but I'm going to find another title for that one. Well, I love that because unstuck people unstick others. And that is what your life is. You are unsticking people like all over the world. That's what you're doing. And so you kind of have to remain unstuck if you're going to keep unsticking other people. And I just love this whole idea of loving everybody always because it sounds like a simple thought. But I think we all know in practice that it's it's really difficult to do. And so what, as we kind of wrap this up, how can we evaluate sort of our scale of how well we're loving others? Yeah, I would though the first thing that came to mind is not making love a transaction between people mm. like I'll express and give love to you, Jessica, if you express and give love to me. And it actually happens that you're a boss at it. 
And so uh, if I hang around just with you, I'm going to feel like I'm a boss at loving people. But what's really happening is that you're a boss at loving people makes me look like a boss. So what I'm trying to do is navigate to those more difficult relationships, the ones that are holding me back, the ones that are in the way. If you really want your graduate degree in this, like how do you engage some of the people that have been off-putting? They broke your heart. They damaged your feelings. They took something away from you you thought was yours. Um, and to just be a little bit more kind, but not fake it. Just be authentic about that. And yet not get stuck in an eddy of introspection. We, uh, uh, When we were in uh, Uganda years ago, I took my son on the Nile. Have you gone down that with that? Yes. Uh, what's it called? A loft or no, something. A drift. A drift, a drift yes. I was like a castaway scene. But like, so... Uh, I took my son on this thing. They go down these like class five rapids and there's no class six. You're just dead. So we go to over this, uh, this big waterfall and Richard pops out of the boat. We get stuck in an eddy on the other side of the waterfall. We lose Richard for 45 minutes. Oh my gosh. He's gone in these like alligator infested waters. Oh I, my gosh. I'm just trying to think of what I'm going to tell Maria, but we found Richard almost an hour la- later uh, holding on on the side of the river to like a mangrove vine. <laughs> oh, my word. And I think sometimes this idea of getting stuck in this eddy, sometimes uh, if you're going to love well, if you really understand what the definition of love is, you need to get out of this eddy that you've been in and get back in the fast moving waters. And I know it's scary and I know you might fail but fail trying. I love that. That is a great way to wrap this up. Bob, it's been so great. I cannot wait. I'm counting down the days to this book launch because we need more Bob in our world. And you are the perfect teacher to teach us how to love. So I can't Um, wait. Tell us when can we order it? How do we order it? Yeah, I think it's out there right now. Uh, and uh, April 17th is when it gets released. Uh, but the uh, but I, we're just like having, we're just giddy around here. We're bouncing around the office and we've got uh, all kinds of things going on. One of the things that will happen is that I hope that this moves the needle a little bit in somebody's life, that they'll move a little bit closer towards this next version of them, the next humbler version of them. And we'll see. And and I want to continue to learn from the people that have been teaching me, the people that have messed up along the way, the people that have been actually difficult for me to deal with. Uh, And so I've let them be my teachers instead of my adversaries. I love that. Okay, we're all going to go buy your book right this second. Oh, I'm just hoping you you like it. Hey, thanks for making time for me. Good being with you. And I'm still laughing. The first time we met, I think that your listeners don't know, there was a big castle set up. Remember that? <laughs> there was. They were putting on a stage play or something, and there was a castle. So I'm like, there's no way you and I are just going to stand in front as if there's not a 60-foot tall, <laughs> 80-foot wide castle behind us. So we dressed up. Who were you dressed up at? You looked very regal. It was like Cam- Camelot, I think, or something. One of the that queens. Was awesome. And we just came out. This was five minutes into our friendship. And we oh, just, yes. just walked out on the balcony and just started waving to people. That was so fun. It was fun. It was the, it was definitely uh, the best way for me to actually meet you in person. Although I have to say, I completely lost my voice on the stage that day. And instead of just owning it and going, can someone bring me water? I tried to fake it. The whole audience was leaning into me like, just about to just throw water at me on the stage. (laughs) And I had so much like vulnerability hangover after that and shame. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I was like just completely messed up at that event. It took me a little time to get over, but then I ended up having some of my top ambassadors became ambassadors at that event. So it was, that was a failure for me, Bob, if you want to talk about a a failure, that, that was a fail for me. And, but I was happy to do it with you there. No better person to fail in front of than Bob Goff. Isn't that great though? You just came up with a different title for that chapter where you would have said like, you know, she needs a glass of water. She's actually received a bunch of new friends because people could identify with that more than somebody that gave like maybe a slick talk. And so I think one of those 
affirmations again you know, that just continue to keep your eye on this idea of love the way you guys are loving these women in somalia with the things that you're doing uh, through love does to enable them to open businesses and all that it's just been beautiful so keep it up friend okay thanks bob all right so long bye I love this idea that we can actually retitle our chapters. Of course, that resonated because I just am wrapping up my own book. And it's just a powerful thought that we can retitle the chapter of our lives so that they don't reflect fear and judgment and scarcity and insecurity. And we can retitle them to reflect hope and faith and abundance. But I feel like in order to retitle our chapters, we often have to realize the false chapters that we have titled them to begin with. So we've got to recognize where we are in order to know where we want to go. And I created a courage quiz. I created a courage quiz for you guys. I did it in collaboration with a courage professor at the University of Florida because I really wanted you to have a tool that helps you identify the areas of your lives where you're practicing courage and then the areas where fear is keeping you back. So I want you to head to my website, jessicahoniger.com, H-O-N-E-G-G-E-R, click on the quiz, take it and tell me if it's helpful for you. You're going to get some tips and hints on how we can just keep going scared. I also cannot wait for next week's episode. I am having such a great time doing this podcast. Many of y'all send in questions for Bob when I put it out there on my Insta stories. Make sure, head over to Instagram, head over to Facebook, tell me what you're learning because it's helping us to create the kind of content that's gonna help you to continue going scared. Thanks again for joining me today and I'll see you next week. Thanks so much for joining me on the Going Scared podcast today. If you like what you heard in this episode, be sure and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and leave a review so other people will join the conversation. If you'd like some behind the scenes looks at my life as a CEO, a mom, and a courage catalyzer, be sure to follow along on Facebook and on Instagram at Jessica Honiger, H-O-N-E-G-G-E-R. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.